This episode is proudly brought to you by Helix NJ, which recently made some big news, some very big news. In case you missed it, Nokia Bell Labs announced their plans to invest in a new state-of-the-art research and development facility located at Helix NJ. Nokia considered approximately 25 different locations across the country for their new home, but ultimately they chose the Helix because of its proximity to major cities, its access to talent, its community of industry-leading companies and universities, and because of its cutting-edge facilities and environments. For those not yet familiar, Helix NJ is a new five-acre state-of-the-art innovation district located in the heart of New Brunswick, New Jersey, that will house some of the world's most brilliant minds, projects, and organizations pursuing critical, life-improving innovations. To learn more, visit www.helixnj.com. The New Jersey Innovation Institute is the conduit that connects one of the nation's leading polytechnic institutions, New Jersey Institute of Technology, to the outside world. Created to leverage the vast resources of NJIT, the New Jersey Innovation Institute is focused on fostering innovation, building companies, and upskilling New Jersey's workforce. NJI employs over 100 people and generates over $35 million in revenue per year in industries such as defense and healthcare. To learn more about the innovative strides being taken at the New Jersey Innovation Institute, head to NJII.com. Entrepreneurs and small business owners, are you feeling overwhelmed by lack of capital, growth challenges, or personal branding? You are not alone. UCS Advisors is here for you. We're professional capital raising advisors committed to helping you secure funding and grow your business. Are you ready to impress investors? Check your investor readiness with our free 45-second quiz at ucsquiz.com. We believe in you. Visit ucsquiz.com and start your success journey. And remember, always be willing to achieve your greatness. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of Greetings from the Garden State, powered by the New Jersey Lottery. I'm your host, Mike Cam. We're here in Totowa, New Jersey today at Sky Lama Studios. Thank you for them for the space. It's a great setup with the cameras, the mics, everything. Uh, we got Keith McPherson, very special guest here today from WFAN. Keith, welcome to the show. Mike, thanks for having me. Sky Lamas, this is awesome. I love the space already. I know it's brand new. I look forward to coming back and maybe renting some time. Let's have a good show today. Yeah, for sure. So, uh, Normally, my guests are not like polished radio or podcast people. Sure. You just get like a lot of just very average, not that, you know, they're not special in their own way. I'm above average. Yeah, exactly. You are above <laughs> average when it comes to, you know, like a show. So uh, this is like, it's almost kind of like uncharted territory for me uh, in a little bit. But, yeah. you know, we'll be good. So we we met at uh, the Prudential Center. Right. Uh, so you're like a big Devils fan. I love that you came decked out in some Jersey stuff with the Devils headband and the shirt. Of course. Um, so uh, I want to like learn a little bit about your Jersey background because that's not something that I knew about you uh, before we met at that tasting. Yeah. So, so you grew up Monmouth County, right? So I grew up in Monmouth County, uh, born and raised, born in Monmouth Medical Center, graduated from Monmouth University. And uh, you played football there, right? I played football at Monmouth University. Yeah. I originally took my scholarship from James Madison University. That's, you know, when I came out of Ocean Township High School, I was one of the top quarterbacks in the state. I signed my letter of intent to play in Harrisonburg, Virginia at James Madison University. At the time, I was young, and I wanted to get as far away as I could, and that was the furthest scholarship offer I had from home, from yeah. New Jersey. Uh, but then I was a fish out of water pretty quickly, homesick, wasn't really enjoying it, and uh, I knew that Monmouth University was uh, getting more scholarships, and I also knew that I needed to figure out what I wanted to do because playing two years of football down there, um, it's funny, college game day, is going to Harrisonburg, Virginia oh, on yeah. Saturday. Oh, yes. cool. Is that like, the, like the, one of the first times that they've done that? This is actually the, the third time oh, or okay. fourth time, Yeah, but it's rare to go there because they're a school that went from what used to be one double-A, yeah. FCS to FBS, and they're still fighting to be acknowledged as like a big-time school. Sure. Um, so when I went down there, you know, I, I got a real good taste of like high-level football, and I'm not the biggest guy, not the fastest guy, but I knew then that I wasn't going to the NFL. Yeah. I'm like, these guys that are here are you know, bigger, stronger, figure faster than me. Yeah, right. I got to figure it out. And I went to school undeclared. So when I went to Monmouth or I transferred home to Monmouth, 
I, I did get a, a scholarship to go play football at Monmouth, but that's when the gears started really turning to say, what do you want to do? And Monmouth had, and they still have, uh, the Plangier Building for Communication, which has a FM radio station upstairs, WMCX 88.9 FM. And then downstairs, they have a real TV studio uh, where we have Hawk TV. Yeah, cool. And so I knew right then and there I'm going to uh, focus on communication, radio, and television. And uh, that's where I got my degree. I'm 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 from the shore. I'm yeah. born and raised. So uh, because you know, it's like you're on WFAN right now, which is the biggest New York sports station. Well, I know it's the biggest New York sports station. It's the biggest. It's one of the sports, biggest. It's since so it was the first twenty four seven sports station. I mean, I grew ever. up listening to it. You know, I think like we way all kind of did. Yeah. I don't think you could avoid it or ignore it if you were into sports in the area. Um, I won't. I won't say it's the biggest now because I don't know the number. I would. It's still the biggest. It's New York. Yeah. Um, it's market one. It's twenty four seven. It's been around since nineteen eighty seven. And uh, yeah, I, I've found a way in the last couple years. I'm coming up on two years this month since my first show. Um, I've had the nighttime slot since November of twenty twenty one. And uh, it, it's been great. It's been a, a life altering experience for sure. Yeah. So when you're so when you're in college and you're deciding what you want to do and you know, we talked about how like it was almost impossible to avoid like Mike and the Mad Dog and like all those other shows that, that existed then and kind of like really changed kind of sports talk radio in a lot of ways. Yeah. Um, was that something that like, you know, before college you were kind of like, oh, this is really cool. Like, I wonder if this could be something that I kind of pursue or was it when you were at actually at school where you're like that's kind of cool. Like I want to start chasing that a little bit. So the first thing that I ever did on a microphone publicly, um, <laughs> I called the Pop Warner football games for Ocean Township. I played Pop Warner football, but when I was 16 years old, I was a, a high school quarterback and they needed someone to call the junior peewee, peewee, and midget football games on Sunday. Yeah. They gave me 50 bucks to get on the loudspeaker at our high school and say, you know, hey, everybody, welcome to Corelli Field. Um, it's uh, Ocean Township versus Manasquan today. And um, I remember <laughs> a guy coming up to the top of the bleachers where I was in the booth and saying, you, you have a good voice. And I was so young. I was so nervous. And I was tripping over people's last names and most of the people were yelling up like, it's pronounced this or you said the name wrong. But this guy came up and said, you should major in communication. And I didn't know what that meant at 16. Sure. But I think we all kind of pretend to be broadcasters. If you're a sports fan, you pretend to be a broadcaster at some point. You pretend to call a game with Mike and the Mad Dog. I think we all have gotten into those debates with our friends over oh, for sure. what players are better, what team is yeah. better. And... When I got to college is when it became real because I could actually I I had a show three hours a day, five days a week, the summer of 2011, where no one told me what to do. Similar to now. Now I have a show every night, three hours, sometimes five hours. No one tells me what to do. It's my creativity, my eye, my mind of what I want it to sound like, be like. And I mean, back then I was a DJ as well. So my show was always like I would bring my mixer, my turntables in, DJ some music for 30 minutes. Then I would read the scores, the baseball scores, the news topics, give my takes and thoughts there. And I was a solo guy. I never really had anybody to go back and forth with. Yeah. But yeah, that's where it all really started. Yeah, that's cool. It's just so funny, too, because like like I grew up like that's how I grew up listening to you know, WFN and like, that's like all me and my dad would listen to in the car, in the car. driving back Stayed and forth from baseball games, like all that kind of stuff. And then when I played baseball in college and I was a college baseball coach for like five years after college. And the last school that I worked at, I was a grad assistant. And every now and then they needed somebody to do like PA for the mm -hmm. basketball games. So I'd be in there like for three. And I was like, this is so cool. Like it's fun. Yeah. It's awesome. Yeah. It's great. Um, and then, you know, eventually kind of got into like the podcasting world. But, uh, before we kind of get into like the career path, I do want to learn a little bit because we were talking off mic before we got started about you know growing up as like a shore kid basically and kind of spending time in like Asbury Park and like all those other places yeah and it's like well because like I'm a North Jersey guy basically like my whole life like now for the last couple of years doing this show I've obviously like expanded my scope of like what all of Jersey has to offer sure uh but even like growing up I mean we would go to Cape May for vacations and some other places down the shore uh, but take me through like like Monmouth County like growing up in that area uh when you were kind of coming up before high school and stuff. Oh, seven, seven, one, two, seven, three, two. I went to ocean high school. I lived in ocean 
from, I, I think when we moved around, I think I was four or five years old when we moved to Ocean Township. And I'm blessed. Like I got to stay in the same town from kindergarten all the way through 12th grade senior year. I know a lot of people don't do that. My wife, she, you know, she moved around a bunch of places, different states, different towns. And uh, growing up, you know, my mom just wanted us in a, a good school system. And Ocean Township had a, has a good school system. And for the most part, it's a pretty safe neighborhood and, and town area. Obviously, little things go on here and there with, with kids being kids. But, you know, now I, I live in Hudson County. I live in Jersey City because I work in New York City. And, you know, the last few years I've lived in Carteret, Bayonne, Weehawken, North Bergen, Jersey City. So I got a good feel of North Jersey over the last let's say seven years that I've been, you know, chasing the dream in New York city, but man, growing up in the shore area, I, you don't, I didn't really appreciate it until I left. I yeah. didn't really appreciate it until I where, you know, people ask, where are you from? And I say the shore. Now I hated saying that for a while. Like when I went to Virginia, because the first thing they would say is, Oh, do you know Pauly D? Yeah. That was the same thing and for me. Like, yeah. You know, no, I don't know Pauly D. <laughs> yeah, I, right. I used to never watch the Jersey shore. I've seen some episodes now, but back then I never tuned into that. And it's funny. I end up working at MTV and running into like Snooki and Jay wow. And those people, but the Jersey shore was labeled like that show for so long. Yeah. And those people were from like Staten Island and North Jersey and other yeah, places. Pauly D's from Rhode Island. Right. You know? So it's like not even. Uh, yeah. But the Jersey Shore, man, is such a nice place to grow up, to raise a family. I, I kind of dream now of uh, owning a, a home in the in the shore area, Monmouth County. Uh, I know everywhere around there, Asbury Park, Long Branch, Tinton Falls, Eatontown. Like that's the area I pretty much grew up in. And do you have like about a, a, do you like a favorite spot now? Like, cause like you're living in Jersey city full time now, yeah. and like getting down the shore over the summer, which I'm sure is hard with, you know, just kind of like schedules and all that kind of stuff, but long branch pier village. Yeah. It's a good and spot. then of course, Asbury park. And, you know, we were talking off, off air about like, you know, how Asbury evolved. Yeah. You know, when I was a kid about eight years old, um, in the mid nineties, late nineties, I used to go with my brother on Saturday morning to get our hair cut on Cookman Ave. There was an all-black barber shop on Cookman Ave. Asbury was run down, desolate, abandoned. Uh, I think it was only, like I told you, the black community still there and the gay community still there in the 90s. And obviously there was a lot of like crime and corruption and some things that went on with the mayor and the police department, and they changed all of that. Yeah. They cleaned all of that up. And the place has evolved. Now it's a real attraction. It's a city by the sea. And I'm, I'm proud to see it. I, I love to go back because my mind's eye has what it used to be when nobody used to be on those beaches. Yeah. Uh, when nobody used to be in restaurants on Cookman Ave. Yeah. And now it's like really nice. Yeah. It's you could sometimes have a hard time getting on the beach or like getting a, yeah. a reservation. It's crowded. Spots. It's expensive. They've built up <laughs> brand new apartments. We were talking about the Asbury Ocean Club. That's like a Miami hotel dropped in Asbury Park yeah. that I would have never imagined. I remember going to see Tiesto play at the... Uh, theater um in like 2009 2010 and that was huge that tiesto would even come and and play there but now it's like you know they have the city by the sea um see here now festival stone ponies summer stage like it's a it's a attraction for people from all over yeah uh, every summer and all year round now yeah no absolutely i, I did my so I've been to this, uh, the Pony a couple times in the past, but like this summer was the first time that I did a summer stage show. Yeah. Crazy. Like such a cool experience and just, you know, you, I know they had Were like, you on the stage? No, no, no. Well, like when you look out from that stage and see all the people, then see the boardwalk and yeah. then the, the sand and the water, it's a movie. Yeah. It's really, it's the whole thing is really incredible. And I love kind of uh, how it's still kept kind of like the coolness factor that it has of like. You know, History. having place like a historic place with like all like the old architecture and all that kind of stuff. There's a lot of we've had on the show a bunch of uh, musicians that live down there mm -hmm. that are like super talented, just indie musicians that play like the Wonder Bar and like all these other spots down yeah. there. Um, but still, it's kind of like taking a lot of steps into like present day. You know what I mean? Sure, and it's iconic. Putting it all together, it's always going to be attached to Bruce Springsteen. I yeah. did a show that there was no music involved. I hosted uh, Paul O'Neill, and we just did a Q&A with Paul O'Neill at the Stone Pony, oh, and cool. like 200 people showed up, 
and people just wanted to see the Stone, the Stone Pony for the first time. Yeah. Uh, even Paul O'Neill, that was his first time coming down there. And for me, I'm just like, this is nuts, man. I grew up around here. Yeah. And uh, now I'm on stage at the Pony hosting a, you know, a Yankee legend yeah, down the shore. Yeah. As And uh, that's why well, I do want to get more into the uh, into your career, too. So, like, you finish up at Mammoth and then now you're ready to kind of start getting like the first couple jobs as a as a communications major. Yeah. Um, so, like, what were some of the first couple jobs that you were getting? Oh, nothing. nothing. It, it was quiet for me. It sucked. Yeah. I struck out a lot, uh, but you learn that, like, you're going to strike out. If you don't have connections, if you don't have family, if you don't have someone to put your resume on top, uh, your resume may never be seen. I've sent hundreds of cover letters and resumes that never were seen or responded to. So I think I mentioned I was a DJ. That was the only thing that kept me alive, kept me afloat. So I DJed. Uh, my house, when I played football, I had a basement in my house. I was, I was the DJ of the football house. Yeah. And I was also that, that year, the only one 21. So I was able to go get two, three kegs yeah. and set Popular up my, guy. my yeah. DJ equipment. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, there'd be about a hundred to 150 people showing up to my, my house, um, which was as far away from campus as I could get it. I lived yeah. in Allenhurst right before you get to Deal Lake into oh, wow. Asbury. Yeah which was like more than a mile away from campus on purpose sure. because the shenanigans that we had <laughs> going on. But then that got me into the bar scene um, in Long Branch, West End, Brighton Ave. Uh, we used to have a bar called Draft House. Jax is still there. There was a bar called Stingers there. Um, I even got into a place uh, in Eatontown and, and did like an 18 and overnight where I, I turned into like a football player, party promoter, DJ, uh, while I was in school and once I graduated that still existed. Yeah, so people didn't know like, you know Oh, Keith is um, not going to class. I'm still like I'm still like a student DJ So when I graduated I'm applying all these jobs. I'm trying to do things and uh, I'm striking out I remember the one gig that I thought I was gonna get was a 92.3 now, which is it's funny because I work in the same building I I, uh, I interviewed for a street team position and was sure that I was getting it. I came back and told everybody, like, this is my big, like, I, I was in there, man. I had my suit on and, you know, they love me. And this, yeah. is, this is how I'm getting in. It was 92.3 now, which turned into like 92.3 amp. And now 1010 Winds Radio is on 92.3 now. Um, but yeah, long story short, I didn't get that gig. But the DJing kept me alive, emceeing in bars and clubs, doing uh, private parties, uh, even rocking the strip club centerfolds on um, the Asbury Circle. Yeah, I was in there uh, a good amount of times making straight cash. That was my job until about two years after I graduated. I got a job at Guitar Center, the first Guitar Center that they opened in Ocean Township. And um, that was Guitar Center 829. I know we were talking about the one right here in Totowa. I used to be on the phone checking Totowa's inventory. Like, yeah. hey, do you have this Pioneer CDJ? I'm trying to make a sale. And um, I worked there for not even a year. And then I got my actual big break, which was the MLB Fan Cave. Yeah. So um, while you're doing this stuff and like, you know, the 92.3 and like all those other things that you're doing, obviously, like right now you talk about sports. So like as you're doing this kind of after your uh, playing career is over, are you like doing other stuff? Maybe not in, I don't mean to see like in sports, but uh, trying to like maintain that connection or just like being a sports fan at that point. I'm in the bar watching sports, talking to complete strangers. I'm going to any games I can get a free ticket or a $10 ticket for back then. The internet was not what, what we have now. Yeah. Like, you know, there was a little bit of Twitter talking about sports, posting about sports on your personal Instagram. But, it, the you know, now, like I always tell these young kids, I'm like, there's no gatekeepers. You can start your own show on TikTok. You can make your own YouTube channel. Like I wasn't doing all of that yeah. back then. I was really just, you know, into the music, DJ, party, promoter, bars, clubs, private events, strip club. But everybody knew me as a football player. And I just always had sports knowledge yeah. from watching I, my, my wife. Uh, it's funny because I told my wife, my wife and I met in college, you know, I used to wake up and watch 6 a.m. Sports Center. And it was appointment television for me to watch the 6 p.m. Sports Center. 
She's like, why are you always watching Sports Center? She's like, you watch it on loop. You've watched the same Sports Center over and over again. I'm yeah. like, one day this knowledge is going to pay off. I'm like, one day all of this that I'm soaking in about these different players and coaches and teams and leagues, I'm like, it's gonna, it's gonna come back. And, yeah. And and it has. But in the beginning, like getting out of college, I I got no love. Like I could not get a job. I couldn't. I got one interview at ninety point two point three. Got ghosted there. Yeah. Um. Tell me about the MLB fan cave job. So that was more of an audition. Okay. Thank God I went to JMU, like I mentioned. Uh, this girl, Victoria Rich, shout out to Victoria. We're still friends. She went to JMU with me and stayed in touch on Facebook. And when I went to Monmouth University, anyone that went to Monmouth University saw me with a blue Yankee cap on over my face all day, every day. I did presentations in front of the class with a Yankee fitted on. It was just... It was part of my my look. I yeah. remember I used to say I'm a cartoon character. I wear a Yankee hat, white tee, blue jeans, and Converse every day. Yeah. Not really trying to impress anybody, just being my regular self. So she would see me in, in these pictures on Facebook, and she's like, you always wear a Yankee hat. Are you a big Yankee fan? I'm like, of course. I like almost used to get insulted when people would be like, you a Yankee fan or are you just wearing the hat? Yeah. And I'm like, what do you want to talk about? The rotation, the bullpen, the lineup? like <laughs> The minor league system? Yeah. Like, yeah. Like, <laughs> like, I don't, I'm not, this isn't this for year. style. You see how dirty this hat is? <laughs> like I get a new hat on opening day. I wear that till the season ends. So she pitched to me the MLB fan cave because she was working in casting for MTV. Okay. Uh, the fan cave had been going for three years, and the fourth year they said that they wanted to have a TV show, and they were looking for... Uh, you know, MTV to cast the right people that could like be sports fans, baseball fans specifically, but also play well on TV. And she pitched this to me and I had no idea. She's like, you need to send a two minute video talking about yourself, who you are, what you do and submit it to us. We'll get it in front of Major League Baseball. I did that. She got back to me right away and she's like, they like you. You're definitely in the running. Like, hang tight. That was in November of 2013. Yeah. I'm working at Guitar Center. I'm not really thinking too much of it. Fast forward to January. I'm in the running. I'm in the like 18 people. February, they fly us out to Arizona for spring training. It's a casting call audition. And there's 18 different fans from different cities. Some double like there was a girl from New York that was a Yankee fan, but she didn't stand a chance against me. <laughs> Speaking of like rotation bull, sure. yeah. she, she didn't know which pitchers were in our rotation or in our bullpen at the time i couldn't i stopped yeah. talking to her. <laughs> I'm like, yeah. Yeah, you can't yeah because then um, she's gonna start picking up stuff from you what and are then, we talking about yeah. and exactly why am right. i giving you game we're auditioning technically we're competing and you don't know the difference between a, a reliever and a starter <laughs> but yeah I, I went out and crushed the um audition and got into the mlb fan cave which was like a, a real world style thing. Yeah. Uh, eight fans from around the country are chosen to watch 2,430 regular season Major League Baseball games from the MLB fan cave live in New York City. It was like a fishbowl, uh, like floor to ceiling windows, people watching us all day. We're in there watching baseball, playing ping pong, drinking beers, uh, playing fantasy baseball, making content. And and that will always be where I like consider that my my big break. Yeah, for sure. That's got that's, must be such like a, for the entire season doing something like that. That's got to be like such a crazy experience for well, sure. I, I yeah. would never do it again. Yeah, <laughs> but it was a sacrifice. I gave up a young summer of my life where those were fourteen hour days. You're in there from first pitch to last out, and yeah. you can't leave. Like I don't order Grubhub anymore because I ordered all my meals off of Grubhub in there. <laughs> Like ever, like like yeah. even a snack. Like yeah. I need a snack. Thank God for it. I mean, that was like that was early on in the. Grub that was when Grubhub like first yeah. started. Yeah. Um, I remember like I don't even think it was it was like seamless. Yeah. It was called seamless and then turned yeah. into Grubhub. But yeah, uh, you know, first pitch could be at one oh five. First pitch could be at twelve thirty five. You got to be in that fan cave ready to go um, to watch the game. And we used to play games in there like home run derby. We called it. We pick a player every day that we thought was home going to homer and tally up our homers at the end of the week. And we did interviews with players, gave tours, uh, shot a lot of content for MLB.com. The fan cave had their own handles. Yeah, it was, it was crazy. It was a wild experience. Um, it was, it was like a social experiment. We were actually the last class of it. Um, Bud Selig's last year as commissioner. Okay. I think Rob Manfred came in, looked at the books, 
said, you guys are paying these kids $6,000 to sit there and watch baseball all day. Uh, $6,000 a month. Yeah. Um, <laughs> $6,000 <000 laughs> would not have been fair not for the whole it, right? thing. Yeah. Uh, but no, they actually took care of us. I had an apartment in Soho. Cool. I just went by with my wife this past weekend, 90 Thompson Street, uh, apartment D5. They put us up in, in a nice apartment. Uh, I got to meet a lot of baseball players, celebrities. And that was the first thing I actually put on my resume, right? It was like Monmouth University, Guitar Center, boom, MLB Fan Cave. Yeah. And then from there, like we were talking about before, like obviously that's like a big like who you know almost type of thing Mm because like having that relationship kind of at least greases the wheels a little bit for kind of like, hey, put this uh, intro video in, like an audition video. Um, But then from there, are you like... Okay, this is like being like a personality, like on air personality type of thing. No, like this not is what yet. we're gonna chase. I no. remember being in there and uh I met Mark Malusis, okay, who was at the fan. The moose and Joe Causey, who was on CBS radio, and they gave out WFAN keychains. And I took that keychain and I put that keychain on my key. It's still on my key, it's been on there for nine years. And I remember just being, you know, when you're young and you're trying to shoot your shot, like, I'll do anything. I'll intern. Like, I'll, I'll, I'll bring you coffee. Like, you know, and, and Moose was kind of just like, nice, nice to meet you, kid. Like, yeah. good luck with everything. Even Joe Causey, like, yeah, send me your resume. But, like, you know, I wasn't thinking that I could be a radio host on the radio. I was dreaming it. Sure. But I wasn't thinking it was a path. Um, I just was hoping to get any opportunity. And the opportunity that came was through MTV. Because MTV2 did a show called Off the Bat. It was Tuesdays. They would come to the fan cave and they would film. The hosts were Sway, Melanie Iglesias, Chris Stefano, and Fat Joe. Oh, wow. And every week a different baseball player would come in. Like David Ortiz came in. That was the biggest one. Uh, CeCe Sabathia, uh, Joey Bats, um, Adam Jones. Uh, there was a bunch, Dexter Fowler. There was a bunch of baseball players that came through. David Robertson was one of my favorite guys because he came to visit me a couple of times when it wasn't TV related. But yeah. that show went on, and uh, I actually got sent home from the fan cave um, early. I got sent home October 7th just because we had like a, a wine party. We were all partying and drinking, and a little bit of an argument happened between like I don't know some stupid guy that was in there like disrespecting the cave dwellers. Like he got drunk and was like making fun of us for some reason like what do you guys do here and i like stood up to him like bro shut the shut up like (laughs) like you're a grown man like making fun of kids and i guess someone didn't like that and they're you know i actually was standing up for my guy dan shout out to dan if dan sees this because dan now works at major league baseball since then oh yeah he went on to do just fine (laughs) and i was taken up for him and they you know they sent us home but we realized uh this was the key thing every year before it was like survivor style in the fan cave. They sent someone home every month or so. Oh, okay. They didn't do that with our group. They kept our group together for TV and, and internet purposes. But then when it got to October, uh, the Yankee season was, was over anyway. Uh, we were kind of just hanging around waiting for the postseason to end. And they sent us two home. Dan is from Massapequa. So all they had to do was get him in a car service. I'm from Monmouth County. All they had to do was get me in a car service, send us home. Yeah. And then they only had... Uh, I think like four people left in the fan cave to send to the uh, World Series, which ha- happened to be in Kansas City and San Francisco. They, you know, took care of their flights and, and all of that. But yeah. um, I went home from October to March applying to jobs for about five months. And the only job that, you know, I got was MTV2 because a lady named Brittany Travis remembered seeing me in the fan cave identified that on my resume, that one little thing on my resume, brought me in for a social media coordinator position at MTV2. And I was probably a week away from taking a job at Home Depot and Neptune. Sure. Um, literally was like going to, because I couldn't go another month. I I think I had ran, ran out of the money that I saved from the fan cave. Yeah. Was living with my mom and <clears throat> Home Depot was walking distance from my mom's house. If if she did not come, come come calling in the beginning of March for me to interview and, and get that job, I would have worked at Home Depot for sure. Yeah. The Mayo Performing Arts Center is the heart of arts and entertainment in Morristown, New Jersey. MPAC presents over 200 events annually and is home to an innovative children's arts education program. To see MPAC's upcoming schedule of world-class concerts, stand-up comedy, family shows, and more, head to mayoarts.org or just click the link in our show notes. 
Want to give your guests something they'll talk about for years? OMG Tarot delivers spot-on tarot card readings that will make your next birthday party, holiday party, team lunch, or girls' night unforgettable. To learn more, visit omgtarot.com. Hey folks, I want to tell you about the crew over at Make Cool Shit. These are the magicians who recently gave our podcast a jaw-dropping makeover. You know how we roll here at Greetings of the Garden State podcast, right? We're all about that Garden State attitude. Well, Make Cool Shit shares that same vibe, and they've got something absolutely epic to offer. It's called the Unlimited Cool Shit Design Subscription. It's a game changer, my friends. Imagine this, unlimited creativity, one flat monthly fee, and none of that boring stuff. It's like having your very own army of design superheroes on speed dial. Whether you're a fresh race startup or a seasoned business looking to shake things up, the team at Make Cool Shit has got your back. It's all about making your brand sizzle, no matter where you are in your journey. So if you're ready to turn your ideas into mind-blowing realities, then it's time to connect with Make Cool Shit. To check them out on Instagram at at WeMakeCoolShit or visit their website, WeMakeCoolShit.co. Remember, that's co, not com. So you get the MTV2 uh, job and you're working there and, you know, kind of doing your thing as like a social media uh, coordinator, you said. Mm-hmm. So like um, while you're there, like obviously like you're, I would imagine you're still trying to like chase like an on-air thing or is sure. it uh, like at what point do you kind of have like that first break where it's like now I'm like a radio host because I feel like a lot of the stuff that you've been doing, like while you're making content and doing stuff like that. And I, you know, I don't do a five hour show and we do like 45 minutes or something, but I would imagine like, that's like a whole other level of kind of like, you know, uh, organization coordination and kind of prep logistically and, prep all that yeah. kind of stuff. So, you know, uh, the journey and the path to things it's, you know, I just was posting this thing about, um, you know, how God has plans for us. And we all have this dream of a destination. But if God shows you the plan, right, and shows you what you're going to have to do and go through to get to that destination, you might say, forget that destination, forget that dream. Yeah. It was always my dream. It was always my destination because I went to school for it. I'm a sports fan. I I knew that I wasn't going to make it pro in sports, but I can make it pro talking about sports. So when I got the job at MTV, I remember the biggest things for me were that it was a New York City job. I wanted to go back to New York. I contemplated getting an apartment in New York out of the fan cave and not going home, but I knew that was going to burn the like $12,000 I had saved. Real quick. Yeah. Super fast. Um, So it was a New York job where I literally had to commute two hours to every day. Like that was a sacrifice. That was tough from exit 109, taking the bus from Red Bank to Port Authority every day. So it was a New York job, but then also I love the Yankees. And living down the shore, that's a long trip to Yankee Stadium. Uh, I knew working at MTV, I was cutting that trip more in half, where I could get on the train in 30, 40 minutes from MTV and be at the stadium. Yeah. So um, I took that job, and I'm I'm still kind of, now that I have the fan cave image, right, now that I have some followers from being in the fan cave and, and being on what wasn't even called Yankees Twitter yet, I'm still keeping up with, like, you know, breaking news and things about the Yankees, giving my takes online, doing little Snapchat videos or Instagram stuff. Um, but I'm I'm also behind the scenes at MTV2 as a social media coordinator, learning how to edit videos, learning how they go about attacking, uh, you know, scheduling and gaming the algorithm and the system. Uh, two and a half years goes by there. And now I had experience. I remember applying to jobs and it was always like you needed three to five years of experience. And I'm like, how am I going to get three to five yeah, years? For like an entry level job. Yeah. I'm like, like, I don't have like, you yeah. don't get out of college with that experience. Like, I, like I'm disqualified right off the rip because I was young. But once I had the fan cave with MTV, now I have over three years of experience at two pretty good spots at, at two yeah. pretty like marquee spots on yeah. my resume. And I just quit MTV. I remember I quit. They just kind of like disrespected me. They put somebody, they put somebody in over me as my manager. Um, They upgraded me to social media manager from coordinator, but they like gave me a boss that was younger than me from like a different department that I was like, this girl doesn't know our processes. She doesn't know what I do every day. Like now I got to answer to her. I'm like, I'm, I'm not feeling this. I'm out. And my true North was always sports. Yeah. So when I quit, I drove Lyft Uber for about a month, month and a half, and I had a routine of, like, getting up and driving the morning commute, taking people to school, taking people to work, taking people to the train, and then I would come home, shoot off emails, apply to jobs, and then, you know, eat lunch, and then get back in the car to pick people up from school, from work, whatever, and come home and do that again and go to sleep, unemployed. Right. Um, 
Here comes Fubo TV, which now is so much bigger than it was when they got in touch with me. But they had their startup. They had their first big office in New York City, and they were looking for a social media manager that knew sports, specifically American sports, because Fubo, the base word from football, football, soccer, their platform came to America to stream European soccer to Americans. Interesting. Champions League, Bundesliga, um, all types of, um, you know, European soccer. So when they interviewed me, they had told me they had interviewed like seven people. And I know how I won the interview is because I was such a social media guy. I went and combed through all their social media and I had a list of things that they did wrong. Um, players' names that they put wrong, yeah. stats that they had wrong, information that they had wrong. And I'm like, who is doing this? And they told me that they had two remote guys from Romania running yeah. there. Yeah, so, a so couple of like $5 yeah. VAs. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Might have been doing it for free just Man. to have a free account. Seriously. Yeah. Rosvon and EV Juice. <laughs> Shout out to those guys. They ended up working for me. So I, I get that job in August of 2018 after working at MTV 2015, 16, 17. Um, I get that job August of 2017, and I work there until the summer of 2018. And I'm their first social media manager. I'm working with their marketing team. Now I'm learning more marketing stuff. Yeah. Um, and now I'm really working in sports and I help build their brand with my sports knowledge because I'm behind their brand every day tweeting about sports. I'm putting out uh, prizes, I'm putting out contests. Um, so people could win prizes. I'm really like getting up. I'm going to all of the spots like ESPN, Bleacher Report, uh, Barstool, and I'm commenting and I'm kind of gaming the system to make sure. Fubo pop up there. And people are like, yeah, all right, well, I'll take a seven day free trial. And they put their credit card in and now they've, they're Fubo customers. Um, I do that for not even a year. So August to like June and Rock Nation comes calling. And a girl messages me on LinkedIn saying Rock Nation is looking for a digital marketing manager. I'm a DJ. I'm a music guy. Yeah. I love Jay-Z. I love hip hop. I'm a former football player. I'm a sports guy. They want me to work for Rock Nation Sports Agency. So I leave Fubo and I take that job. It was a higher paying job, higher profile job. And I only worked there for three months. Just wasn't wasn't, wasn't for me at all. Yeah. The culture wasn't for me at all. No knock to them because I thought I had made it. I, I'm like, this is the dream. There's no better place in New York to work. Yeah. But the culture was very much like old school record label culture, hustle and bustle. You're at the bottom of the totem pole. You do everything that's asked to you. You work your way up. And they also had an L.A. office. The biggest thing I used to hate was that like social media, they don't turn off. So uh, there's a three hour difference between here and L.A. Yeah. And. I might be getting calls to do something for social media for somebody like Todd Gurley, who's playing for the LA Rams and it's 2 AM. Yeah. I'm like, I, I don't, I can't do this nah. So I ended up having some back and forth with them and they kind of gave me an ultimatum and I showed up after like the 4th of July and I was like, I'm out. And that is what pushed me into, okay, you're unemployed again. The Lyft Uber thing. I didn't do again then. I ended up picking it up a little bit, but then I like collected unemployment. But that's when I said, I'm buying a camera. I went and bought like a Canon little PowerShot G7X to vlog. I bought a new MacBook. Now, from doing social media, I learned how to edit videos. I learned a lot about marketing. I learned about how to schedule. I learned about how to like, so now I just had to tap back into what I did in school, being yeah. on a microphone and camera right. and piece it all together. Yeah. You know, I think it's like so interesting about kind of like what you're talking about and your your path because like, like I listen to the fan every day. Mm -hmm. So like literally from, and I drive all over the state almost every day. And so I'm literally listening to like Boomer and Geo in the morning all yep. the way through you in the evenings. So it's like, when I see stuff that's like, uh, like whether it's WFAN that's posting it or like the sh individual show accounts and stuff like that, what I think is super interesting about kind of your story is the other shows, it's kind of just like, here's the WFAN kind of clip from today of, you know, Geo yelling about Carl Banks or something, you know? So, but then <laughs> good, it's like, good reference, good yeah, pull. See, I'm, I'm listening. Uh, but then like with a lot of your stuff, just like following your own account, like you're doing a lot of that stuff in studio on your own for your, like your own purposes, which I think is like really interesting and like really cool and kind of shows like almost like a different approach almost to kind of the kind of pulls the way the that it's been back. the way that it's been done. Yeah. And it's a little under the hood, you know, like you see what actually goes into like, you know, it's like coming back from any a break. Other host. Yeah. But but that's because I'm true to myself. Right. I've always done that. Yeah. I've always shown people, right? Like I've always 
just picked up the phone wherever I was. That's the vlogging aspect of it. That's just the like, you know, what are people following you for? They want to see that type of stuff. Yeah. Everybody can listen to the radio. Everybody can turn, you know, on the Odyssey app. But like you have to specifically be following me to see. Like, we're in here. When this is done, I'm going to show people what this looks like. Yeah. I'm going to tag you. I'm yeah, going right. to, you know, because I just know to, to, to do all of that from yeah. my experience being the guy uh, behind the scenes for Charlemagne's show or Nick Cannon's show where I'm filming them and they're telling me, hey, get this. Make sure you're showing people that, like, I just kind of, you know, picked up so many things along the way uh, where I've become like a one-stop shop and I, I just know what to do. Yeah. So, uh I want to just skip ahead a little bit because I think we're close to it. Getting the WFAN jo- uh, WFAN job, mm-hmm. uh, like how did that happen? And then was that kind of like your first, sh- like, I mean, it's a five-hour show normally. Is that like kind of your first foray into like being a radio host? Or you, did you do something like right before that? Podcast. Podcast. Okay. So um, 2018 happens. And I mean, that summer, man, I, the, the greatest battle is man versus himself. You are going to look in the mirror some days and say, you're not good enough. You suck. You're, you, you're going to lose. You're, 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 you're failing. Yeah. You made a mistake. You should have stayed at that job. You shouldn't have done, like, you know, I had a lot of those days. But then I had other days where I was like, man, F that. I'm going to win. Like, I, like I, I can't lose. Yeah. I'm going to leave no stone unturned. I'm going to do everything, grind, like figure everything out. And I did. I took a lot of freelance opportunities doing photography, editing videos for other people, helping other people out, doing promo for other people for free just to, like, sharpen my sword. So that summer of 2018, um, and shout out to my wife because I wouldn't have made it without my wife believing in me and she believed in me from being in in class with me at mom of the university yeah like this guy's talented i'm sitting here watching like you know she always talks about how she's like you always got better grades than me in any radio television stuff and she's like all those professors liked you i guess they knew i'm like yeah i guess they saw something (laughs) they had a little bit of an inkling but yeah shout out to my wife because like you know, imagine your significant other comes home and is like, I don't have a job anymore. I'm collecting unemployment. I'm driving yeah. Lyft Uber. I haven't worked at a restaurant for a very little bit of time, two months, because I was loading, man. And I knew that I could not, I just knew that I could not um, take a full time job 40 hours a week in an office, which required really like 50, 60 hours with the commute and everything else, even stuff you do at home, because I'm like, I'm building, I'm building my own personal brand. Yeah. Right now that I'm out here, uh, 2018, that summer, I went to as many Yankee games as I could get to, whether I had a free ticket, a $5 ticket, because I knew I have Yankee fans from 2014 following me the last four years that want to see Yankee Stadium, want to see how we party in Billy's, want to see what the bodega is like, want to see what the dugout is like, want to see what the bleacher creatures are like, and want to see what Legends is like. And I I can show you that. If yeah. you live in Kansas and you're following me, you can see what the Bronx is like on game day. You can be watching live as um, you know Aaron Judge hits a home run, and I got it all on camera and like uh, – that led me into, and I was doing some of that with, with a, a group called Bronx Pinstripes. Um, I actually invited them to the fan cave in 2014, and I stayed in touch with them. So they saw me building, and they're like, hey, do some digital stuff for us. I would take over their Snapchat. I would take over their Instagram. They had a bigger following than me, but it helped build my brand. Yeah. 2019 comes, and they have a podcast they, they've been doing since the 2017 season where the Yankees got to game seven of the ALCS. And they're saying, you know, we've got a lot of listeners. We want to branch off and build another pod. That's like a, a sister pod or a brother pod or a counter pod to us. And they pair me with um, JJ from Barstool who had success with Barstool, but left Barstool and then rebranded himself as JJ from the Bronx. But he had a, a bunch of Twitter followers in the Yankee universe as well. They put us together. We do a podcast called George's box um, it was basically ripping off of Susan Waldman's goodness gracious, Roger Clemens, Roger Clemens <laughs> is in George's box. Yeah. So that name of the podcast got people's attention and it was just real like Yankee fans talking about their perspective and real life stuff. And it blew up fast. And, um, I didn't get paid a dollar for that. Uh, but they made money off of the ads and some other things and the brand. I, I made videos and helped build the brand accounts. And I realized at the end of the season, that was the 2019 season. Uh, I wasn't really, I didn't really have a seat at the table with the business and the things that were happening. So I 
just realized that I needed to walk away and keep focusing on Keith McPherson brand. And I was a fan of everybody else doing Yankee podcast. And I was listening to talking Yanks every yeah. day, John boy and Jake, John boy was doing talking Yanks. John boy. I remember watching John boy come up when he was out West and his, his Twitter avatar used to just be a picture. And it was the picture from Snapchat where we used to be able to make our own Snapchat, like, oh, yeah. like bit emojis or yeah, something yeah. like that. So I end up linking with John Boy at the stadium. We exchange numbers, and then the winter comes, and I'm still unemployed. But I had worked at this barbecue restaurant for two months. I, I sold some of my old Jordans, some of my old Yankee memorabilia just to, like, stay alive and be able to com- keep pay- paying my bills and my rent. But John Boy lets me know, hey, man, we're, like, we're getting funding. Like, we're actually building a company. Yeah. And I just saw your resume. You're saying you're looking for a job. You've done social media work, video editing, social media managing. Like, we could use a guy. And you already have a name in the Yankee space. You're right here. We can hire you as, like, an intern right now as we go through our first round of funding. Yeah. $15 an hour, I'll take it. <clears throat> yeah. And then they launched an office in the Bronx. And I started doing a, another podcast with the Yankee about the Yankees called Pinstripe Strong. I did that with Joe's McFly, who was under John Boy still is. Shout out to Joe's. Shout out to Pinstripe Strong. Pinstripe Strong Army. Um, that podcast grew. And then John Boy says, okay, Kevin Durant and Kyrie Irving are in New York now. We need a vertical for the Brooklyn Nets and Brooklyn Nets fans. I'm from New Jersey. I'm a Nets fan. Yeah. I'm like, I guess that's me. And I build talking Nets out to the point where Kevin Durant follows it. And the Yes Network now gets a load of me. The Yes Network runs two Yankee commercials with me called Fandom Acts of Kindness. And then they do a special on me about talking nets. So now I'm starting to buzz. Now I'm starting to build. Now I'm starting to be on TV. I'm starting to be seen. I don't have a full-time job sure. yet, but I have like the John Boy media money. And then, you know, 2020 hits and John Boy does bring me on full-time. And then we fall into the pandemic. And at the time I'm like, what are we going to do? There's no sports. Like, yeah, we're doing sports podcasts, but in a weird way, we had a captive audience where like we, we all grew and built because everybody's at home. Everybody's listening to podcasts, watching YouTube on their phones. Yeah. And I kept building and growing through 2020 when they put us back outside in 2021. Now I'm back doing what I was doing with the vlogs. I'm at the stadium. I'm like now I'm outside. People can walk up. Yo, Keith, can I get a selfie? Like people can see me again. Yeah. John Boy and Jake get an opportunity to take over Moose and Maggie on WFAN. Okay. Because Moose and Maggie were fans of them. Yeah. They take over the midday and it sounds like an episode of Talking Yanks. It sounds like John Boy and Jake radio. It sounds like, and I'm working for them. I'm working with them. I'm proud of them. I'm happy for them. And I remember posting, I'm like, I'm a radio TV major. I love this stuff. I'm like, the fact that we made it from social media, Yankees, Twitter, YouTube, podcast, to WFAN, New York Radio, this is amazing. They, they're one and done. That was August 6th of 2021. They're one and done with that. They don't do that again. A week goes by, and Spike Eskin, the new program manager at WFAN, I guess he looked through the catalog of John Boy Media Talent, and he saw me who did a Nets podcast, the Nets games air on WFAN. Yeah. And I also have two Yankee podcasts under my belt, the Yankees air on WFAN. And then he looks on my LinkedIn and I have a radio television degree. He reaches out and says, would you like to audition? Would you like a chance to be on WFAN? I'm like, hell yeah. Like, yeah. Is, like <laughs> yeah. This, is, this is for real? Yeah. Who is this again? <laughs> uh, and, you know, and yeah. I went and checked his credentials and everything. Sure, I'm like, okay. And like his dad, Howard Eskin, yeah. is huge in Philadelphia, like started WIP and, and that down there. I'm like, this is legit. I'm like, wow, this has actually happened. I didn't tell a soul. Right. And Can't touch the money just yet. Nope. Yeah. I, I learned that because I talked about 92.3 yep. now. I went yeah. on that interview, came home telling everybody, yeah, I'm going to be working at the radio station <laughs> in the city. Didn't get it. And, then, you know, that was a terrible feeling. So I learned not to touch the money. And then one day I wake up to tweets. Boomer and Geo are talking about how, you know, auditions are going on. Things are happening here. New program director. We're trying to bring some new blood in the WFAN. And they're like, someone named Keith McPherson is on next Wednesday night. And they're like, Keith McPherson? Who the hell is that? The joke was like, oh, that's probably one of those guys that sleeps in the Chase vestibule downstairs. 
<laughs> and there's literally like next to WFAN, I go into that chase all the time. Yeah. Yeah. They have security in there now because there's homeless people that sleep out there that used to sneak into the ATM and, and like act like they were using the ATM and sleep in there for yeah. the warmth overnight. So they, they liken me to one of those guys. Sure. Yeah. But Yankees Twitter, who's had my back, they start chirping off at Keith McPherson. I'm sleeping. Yo, Keith, is this true? Yo, Keith, are you going to be on WFAN next week? Boomer and Geo just said your name on the morning show. So I'm like, cat's out of the bag next Wednesday night. Let's do it. Yeah. And the rest is history. I crushed my audition and uh, I'll, I'll fill in some more. I'll let you ask yeah, some yeah. questions. Yeah. So like, I, what I think is like, it's just so cool to kind of see like this whole path. And honestly, like, you know, my story, especially like the last couple of months is like, honestly, very similar in a lot of ways, just with like like unemployment and like getting laid off and like then kind of chasing like the brand thing and building different things. So I think it's just like all super interesting to kind of see like where you work and kind of the path to this. Cause like, I feel like a lot of people, like when they, if they're like uneducated about like the industry or maybe just your personal background, they're like, Oh, he must've been, cause like a lot of the guys on the fan right now, I know we're like working in different markets and kind of like worked their been way. In radio, yeah, or been interned in radio. Yeah. Or worked in that building for 10 years and worked their way up to get to the mic. Yeah. And it's just yeah. so interesting to kind of see like, how your path is just so unique compared to like everybody else, which I yeah, think is, you know, I'm different than anybody in there. It's good. And sometimes it's not, not great. Sure. Like when I came in, I felt like there was a little bit of animosity because like I, jumped, radio, yeah. I jumped the line. Yeah. But you know, I'm, I'm a good guy. And I think the guys inside there learn that I'm a good guy. I'm a team guy. I'm a hard worker. I carry the banner for WFAN and I earned it too. I just earned it outside the building. Yeah. I've been working for a long time to get to, where I am. I just didn't do it by going to get Mike Francesa a Diet Coke. Sure. Yeah, you know? exactly. Um, so uh, you get the job, you're doing the show. What I also think is really interesting about your show is that, um, like, obviously there's like the stuff that everyone at the, sh at the station needs to talk about jets, giants, you know, Mets, Yankees, like all that kind of stuff. Um, but like, you're like the only one that talks about the devils or like talks about the WNBA, which I think is like really interesting. So how are you <laughs> like, like, because obviously you need to balance it almost with like stuff, you know, is going to like work in that market, but then also like, you know, talk about stuff that people are maybe like a little bit less educated about. I, I want my show to be different. Yeah. And I also want to share the light. And I know that with a five hour show, I can't talk about Zach Wilson for five hours. I can't talk about Aaron Rodgers. I could. Sure. We do that every day. Yeah. But I want to be able to break through. I want somebody to turn on the radio and be like. He's talking about Sabrina Ionescu and the New York Liberty. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, yeah, because all day we talk about who's going to end the drought in New York. What team's going to bring us a championship? It's been too long since we have a parade. Well, the Liberty are in the finals, if you didn't notice. Even I mentioned Gotham FC the other night. I'm like, they just won the National Women's Soccer League championship while you were not paying attention at yeah. all. They count as champions from New York. These women live here, work here like they rep New York City. So with the Devils, man, the Devils story was awesome because um, I wasn't a hockey fan. And I was when I was young. But when I was young, I was like, a let's play uh, roller hockey sure. outside, yeah. collect the trading cards, play NHL 96, 97 on Super Nintendo. Like, I liked hockey, but, like, I was a Rangers fan and Devils fan as a kid because you're allowed to do that. And because they won Stanley Cups right next to each other. Yeah. So, like, I had Devil's gear, I had Rangers gear, and I didn't have a hard, like, affiliation or, or fandom or loyalty. But I feel like, I forget, and I always, like, I got to go back and look at the history. I think the NHL locked out for a brief amount of time while I was a kid. Yeah, in the and, 90s at some point. Yeah, in the 90s 90. at some point they locked out, and I didn't understand it. Yeah. And I just remember being, like, disappointed and mad. I'm like, I don't like, I don't like hockey anymore. Yeah. And at the time... Wah, 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 wah. Here comes Michael Jordan. Dum, dum. Like Mike, I like to be like, so I got like infatuated with Michael Jordan and the Bulls yeah. and then really got into the NBA. And I always say on air, it's hard to be an NBA fan and NHL fan as a diehard because they overlap. Sure. The seasons overlap, the games overlap. It's hard to follow both. But when I got to WFAN, I'll always remember, shout out to this old lady that wrote on like Reddit or Facebook. Like people were hating on me as soon as it got announced. Who's this guy, a podcaster, especially taking over for Steve Summers, who shout out to Steve Summers, legend, icon, yeah. Yeah. gracefully like bowed out, retired, and has been nothing but kind and helpful to me and said, no, put him in this spot. I will retire. We need to get younger. But I saw this lady write a comment 
And, you know, I came in and I was telling everybody the same story I told you about how I made it here. And I said, you know, I'm a, uh, I'm a Brooklyn Nets fan. I'm a Yankees fan. I'm a Cowboys fan, but that's not going to dominate my show. My fandom is not going to dominate my show. I'm not a hockey fan, but I'm not opposed to it. I'm not like, I'm not opposed now to like watching and learning and being able to speak about hockey on WFAN. Yeah. Internally, a lot of people said, oh, don't worry about hockey. It just doesn't move the needle. We don't have to talk about hockey. Sure. But I kind of came up with an idea to say, hey, my fandom is open. We have three hockey teams in this area. You have a new, a brand new host on WFAN that you can bring in. Whichever team invites me to a game, shows me around, can lure me into their fandom, and then I'll bring that fandom to the air. The Devils were right away. First off, uh, shout out to Glenn Blackman, who works in Prudential Center. Um, he reached out on Twitter, offering me his tickets as an employee at cool. the Devils game. Yeah. And then once the Devils like front office got wind of it, they're like, oh, no, 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 no. We're making this a thing. So they're like, how many tickets do you need? I brought six friends. They brought me in through VIP, red carpet. They put me on the Zamboni, put me on the big screen, treated me like a celebrity, like a king. Yeah. I'm not even a year in it on WFAN yet. Yeah. And I'm like, wow, you now have my fandom for life? Because my first time entering your arena, my first time they gave me a, a McPherson jersey and it was the, the black sweater with jersey across. Yeah, yeah. I'm like, you guys have sold me because you rolled out the red carpet, treated me like a king. And I'll never have that experience with the other teams I root for. Right. I'll never like I'll never be treated like that there. Yeah. Even if I do get to the level where I'm super famous and they want to, it's not my entry. Sure. So like I'm like now I'm riding for you guys. So I did this whole thing on WFAN because you have to pitch things and play games and like, you know, have people wanting to listen and tease things. So I'm like, went to the Devils game, did a whole YouTube vlog on it, put it on social media, and then National Signing Day came February of 2022. And I did a video in Boomer and Geo's studio <laughs> where I just had no idea. I was supposed to get Craig's Rangers hat and toss it. You know how the kids in National Signing Day, they have hats. Yeah. I had a Devil's hat, the hat hat. I had an Islanders hat, but I didn't have the Rangers hat because I think Craig that day like put it on and wore it home. Yeah. So the only Rangers memorabilia in WFAN was uh, the, the Roger Bear jersey that Boomer has hanging up in the studio. <laughs> Didn't know anything about him. Didn't know anything about Mr. Ranger. Didn't yeah. know anything about Boomer's connection with him. So I'm just playing around in a video, and I, I have on my, um, I have on a, the Devils jersey underneath, and I choose the Devils. And before I choose the Devils, I throw the Islanders hat out of the frame, and I take the Rangers jersey, and I kind of look at it, and I throw it. I throw it on a chair. It doesn't hit the ground. But Tom Izzo, our our video editing digital's guy, he he makes like a like a crashing sound. <laughs> it's like I don't know. So that video goes on WFAN YouTube. Boomer sees it, and Boomer is hot about it. And I have no idea. Yeah, I'm sleeping the next day. Al Dukes calls me. I had been on the radio till like two in the morning before. Al Dukes calls me. I'm like, oh. so I'm like, you know, he's like Boomer wants to talk to you. So like I don't know. It became this whole thing. Where, like, I disrespected Boomer, I disrespected Mr. Ranger, the Rangers fan base. Devils fans ate it up. Yeah. Devils fans loved it. They're like, yeah, that's yeah. our guy. That's Throw how that get, jersey. That's yeah. how you get started. Yeah. But then, you know, Boomer called me off air. We talked for, like, 20 minutes. He educated me on everything. I apologize. And I'm just like, I literally didn't know. I was so naive. But, like, I'm like, now you're not the only one talking hockey on the fan, Boomer. Yeah. And now Devils fans listen after games. Now Devils fans see me at the arena. Now Devils fans feel like they have a voice on the fan in New York. Yeah. That's so cool. I, just, I mean, not the fact that you got, you know, a 20-minute chew-out session about, like, an education, it's all good. An education <laughs> session. Boomer's, Boomer, Boomer is an interesting guy. I have a ton of respect for him. And I, I have more respect for him after that man-to-man -man yeah. conversation. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, so we're getting close to the end of this, and I don't want to keep you longer, or, you know, take up too much of uh, the Sky Llamas guy's time. But I told you in an email earlier this week that we were going to yell about the Yankees for five minutes. Necessary. Let's do that. Like yeah, we have to. What's going on? Like it's such like th this whole week has been, or I guess the last two weeks now. Man, the last eight well, months, nine months, the well, season like, was you, terrible. Yeah. Well, you were talking about like the 2017 Yankees, and it was like. 
that to me is like the last time that I had fun watching a Yankee season. Real joy, real like real an interest hope, and exciting group of that, players. Like we're going back to the World Series. This yeah. is a run that I could get behind. Yeah, excited to go to the stadium. Excited to sit down and watch those games. Um, man, that's where this all really started because they fired that manager. Yeah, and that was Brian Cashman firing that manager. Sam, I want to bring in my own guy that'll do my bidding. And now we're in the Aaron Boone era, and I don't have a problem with Aaron Boone. I'm indifferent on him, and that's not great. You yeah. should feel some kind of way about your manager. But sure. man, the Yankees have underperformed. And they've just made a ton of mistakes with uh, the trades that they've made, the free agents they've passed on, and just not managing injuries correctly. Yeah. That is those three things. That is why they failed these last few years since 2017 and haven't been able to get back to a game, game seven. They got back to the ALCS twice, right? Sure. 2019, 2022. But they were defeated by the Astros. And this last year, this year pisses people off, myself included, so much because you have the reigning AL MVP. You did win 99 games. You did win the division. You you were one of the final four teams. You can't just fall off a clip. You can't have that much of a drop off. Yeah. And then we just celebrated Garrett Cole as the AL Cy Young last night. So you have the best hitter and the best pitcher in the American League, but you won 82 games and it was a struggle to get yeah. to 82 and 80. You know what I think is interesting too? It's like, also, I feel like the Yankees, the way that they were constructed, especially this year with the uh, the pitch clock and like the banning of the shift and like all that kind of stuff. And like all the teams that performed really well were, predom I mean, maybe not predominantly, but like the younger, faster, more mm -hmm. athletic teams. And that is not the Yankees. Right, They were ready for that. You know? Right. The, um, the bigger bases. Yeah. Right. Right. S steals were up. Who's who's stealing bases for the Yankees? Really one guy. And he didn't get on base enough. Yeah. Anthony Volpe. Right. Um, Banning the shift. We thought all of a sudden, like, Rizzo was going to benefit from that. Well, they mismanaged his injury. They had him run out there after like he months. was concussed for two months. Yeah. That's negligent. That's irresponsible. Um, Aaron Judge, as much as I love Judge, I think he's going to change the way he plays. We all wowed at him running through that wall in Dodger Stadium. He even after the game said, oh, the, the wall took the worst of it. No, it didn't. He <laughs> might have been fine up top, but that yeah. little that little toe, that big toe, uh, that, that derailed the season for two months and the Yankees did not have the depth. We had to watch Willie Calhoun DH. Yeah. We had to watch Franchi Cordero run out there. IKF had to play six different positions. Uh, Oswaldo Cabrera was called on way too much. Jake Bowers, an infielder playing in the outfield. Yeah. Second tours from Greg Allen and Billy McKinney. It's not good enough. I go to the stadium and there's people in the stadium. Like who the hell are some of these guys? Yeah, the seriously. Yankees are supposed to be so famous that they don't need names on the back of their jerseys. Yeah. But when you're looking at the Yankees this year, you're trying to figure out about three or four of the guys out there. Never seen them before. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. And it's like crazy too, especially like the last couple of weeks and like, like listening to the fan, like listening to the stuff that, that's coming out. Like, you know, Hal talking to the media and Brian Cashman talking to the media. And then it's like the stuff that they're saying is like, are you serious? Like, is this like, the stuff that you're saying? The like, do you actually believe amazing, that this is right like, with the sleep shit and the bunting stuff <laughs> and like all this other things? And you're like, wh like, why are you, why are these words coming out of your mouth? It's simple. You know, we couldn't hit. Yeah. They had the lowest batting average they've had in years. And they're the Yankees. Batting. And you're the New York Yankees. The New York the Bronx Yankees. Bombers. Yeah. And that's why the, the Mets fans say, oh, the Bronx bunters. Yes. <laughs> we got to put an emphasis on bunting more. Yeah. The disconnect is amazing, right? Yeah. Because they sit up there in their offices looking down upon Yankee Stadium and the Yankee fans and the fans that are in the grandstand and the bleachers are like, this is not what we signed up for. This yeah. is not what we're used to. We weren't expecting this at all. We need hitters. We need consistent hitters in the lineup. We need athletic players that can make plays, that can steal bases, that can make the plays in the outfield, in the infield. Yeah. Um, the disconnect is crazy to me because you have you have Hal talking about bunting and like <laughs> going on. So yeah. He's like, you know, he he thought he was doing something. He's like, you know, here's here's a nugget. Yeah. Here's something yeah, we talked about. Take this one home. Yeah. <laughs> this is something we talked about in August. <laughs> bunting. Yeah. Aaron Boone. Aaron Boone said bunting is coming back into the game. We're gonna put more of an emphasis on bunting. Hey. No. Yeah. You're gonna waste outs. <laughs> yeah, right. you're gonna bunt your. Did you watch who won the World Series? They mashed their way to the World Series. Yeah, Corey Seager, Adelise Garcia, Garcia, Marcus Simeon, Evan Carter. Uh, like they they didn't bunt their way there. No. They hit home runs, yeah. timely home runs when they needed. So you need to have better hitters. It can't all be on Aaron Judge. Aaron Judge's year was a year that I think fooled them. Because Aaron Judge had a year that we've never, ever seen in baseball. Sure. 62 home runs, 131 RBI, ridiculous OPS. 
And he did that to spite them. He did that to say, no, you're going to pay me top money, $40 million a year. Yeah. And they got comfortable thinking they could roll out there with Josh Donaldson and Aaron Hicks and um, DJ LeMayu not being himself. And they got got this year. So now they absolutely have to have a great offseason because what Cashman did in the media, yelling and cursing at oh, the media, he, I think I think we're down. pretty effing good. Yeah. That's, that's, that's bullshit. You know, like yeah. he... he he, now those videos live on the internet forever. forever. Now those quotes are in articles forever and they will not age well if he doesn't do his job. And he's uncomfortable right now because there was a fire cashman night at the stadium. Bald Vinny sold hundreds of fire cashman shirts. He never thought he'd see the day. Yeah. It's crazy. And it's just like, it just, to me, it's like, uh, it's one of those things where I, I don't know who uh, posted it, but it was like something talking about how it's like, he knows that he is like so safe that he can do whatever he wants. Really, the greatest job security in the world. Yeah. The eternal GM of the New York right. Yankees, and he's wind up being like a Hall of Fame executive, most likely. Yeah, he's got a Hall of Fame resume. But yeah. what have you done for us lately? Exactly, Ben. And like someone, uh, I remember this was like maybe at the beginning of the year or halfway through the year when things were starting to go off the rails, and somebody called into one of the shows in the fan, and they were like, "Well, who has more experience than him? Like, wouldn't you want the most experienced guy to run the run the ship?" And you're like. Yeah, he has the most experience. He's like the longest probably tenured GM in baseball. But yeah. like also it's nice to because he doesn't know how stuff's done any other place, you know, and, and that's like a big runs important its thing. Of course. Yeah. I always use the phrase evolve or dissolve. Like you had to evolve as a content creator. You had to evolve as a professional. You had to evolve as a man yeah. to build what we're physically doing right now. Right. You couldn't stay the same for year after year and say, I'm really good. Yeah. <laughs> I know this is working. No, you had to figure it out. Yeah. I feel like Cashman has done some of his same things over and over again. And I'll give the example of Bernie Williams, Derek Jeter, Aaron Judge. They all asked for their uh, contract negotiations to be private. And he used the media and the public against them as a tactic to say, look, look at how much money we offered him. Yeah. We offer him a fortune. You don't want to take this? And they all are like, come on. Like these are those are arguably my three favorite Yankees, beloved Yankees. Yeah. You treated them like assets. You treated them like any other guys. And they have way more value than that. So, you know, some of his old school tactics have blown up in his face. He could have signed Judge, in my opinion, for three hundred million, saved himself sixty million, which could have gone to better hitters, better players on the team. Yeah. Um, you know, thinking that he was getting something with an IKF Donaldson Rort vet trade to get Gary Sanchez and Gio Urshela out of here. Gary Sanchez and Gio Urshela, Gio got hurt, but they Blake Snell just got the Cy Young last night and said Gary Sanchez was was really good for me behind the plate. It was it was a really good year. He he helped me a lot. Yeah, <laughs> so crazy. Yeah, but uh, and we, I'm sure we can we could clearly go on this for. All five hours. Yeah. Yeah. Five <laughs> hours. Exactly. Um, but, uh, so I do want to wrap us up, uh, and I really appreciate you jumping on, on the show with us and talking, I mean, we covered a lot of stuff like your whole career, Jersey devils, Yankees, other sports, all that yeah. kind of stuff. So I really appreciate you jumping on with us and, and doing this with us today. So yeah. if people are listening to this and they don't follow you or they're not, you know, like they're not sure who you are, but they want to learn more, like what are places you would send them to learn more about Keith McPherson? Uh, the biggest platform is WFAN, the fan in New York. I'm the nighttime host. Usually I'm on after the games. Um, so like Monday night football right now, Thursday night football tonight, I'll be on after till 2 a.m. But uh, when there's no game, I'm on 7 to 12. And that's where I really get to talk about all sports, uh, tell stories, take calls, connect with fans on uh, the Internet. That's where they found me. Right. So at Keith McPherson on any platform that you follow people, uh, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok. Uh, YouTube. I don't have the time to service all of them the way I'd like to. I have a seventh month old son, but I'm, I'm pretty available online. I try to connect with people and respond to people, engage with people. Um, the Odyssey app is, is the way that you listen to WFAN uh, on your phone outside of the car. And yeah, sometimes I pop up on MLB Network. I had a TV show on MLB Network last year called Off Base. Uh, I've done some commercials with the Yes Network, and I, I plan to get back on television too. But for the most part, WFAN at night on the Odyssey app streaming, and then on the internet, wherever you follow people at Keith McPherson, first name, last name. Awesome. And uh, also shout out to Sky Llamas for letting us use this space today. We talked about it at the top and, you know, great camera setup, great mic setup. So if you are a podcaster, particularly here in the state of New Jersey, this is a great spot to come down and, uh, you know, check it out, use their stuff. They got, you know, Slavic and Nick are awesome. Uh, so 
Uh, this has been the Greetings from the Garden State podcast, uh, powered by the New Jersey Lottery. I'm Mike Ham. Thank you to Keith McPherson, the Sky Lamas guys. Thank you, everybody else, for listening, and we will catch you next time. <laughs>